So there are needs in your budget and there are wants in your budget. And needs are necessities every single month. And wants, well, they're more fun luxury purchases. This is a part of budgeting that everyone must master no matter what income you bring in. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Rachel Cruz Show podcast. I'm so glad that you're here. So I'm excited. My kids' book is finally in pre-sale, you guys. It is gonna be launching here in about a week. And so I'm really excited about it. It's called I'm Glad for What I Have. And I wrote it because I love a good, rhyming, short kids book to read to my kids, where the message is something I can even take away as a parent. And so I wrote it because I know our stuff can just get in the way. And I know our kids just want to buy and buy and buy. And I know we are tempted to buy and buy and buy. But learning that our stuff is not the thing that fulfills us, but something else is. So I'm not going to give the spoiler to the end of the book, but it is a precious book. I'm so excited about it. So if you have little kids, if you know little kids, make sure to check out I'm Glad for What I Have. I'm really excited about it and hope you enjoy it. And I am so thankful that you guys listen to this podcast. So you can also leave a review if this podcast is something that you love because it helps get it in front of other people too. So, all right, enough about my rambling. Let's dive in to this episode. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different things today. I'm gonna go over a money trap that I fell into and how to avoid it. But first, let's talk about some 90s money principles principles and if they still work today. So take a listen. You guys know I love the 90s. Grew up in the 90s. So when all the stuff is coming back, I just, I love it. And I also host a podcast called Smart Money Happy Hour with my friend George Camel. And we talk a lot about the 90s because it just gets brought up. And growing up as a Ramsey kid, I've been hearing my dad's money advice since the 90s. So recently I've been thinking, I wonder what money advice from the 90s still stands today. And even though the financial industry has evolved over the last 30 years, our Ramsey money principles have stayed almost exactly the same. People usually have lots of thoughts about this, but they have stayed consistent. So today, I'm going to unpack some of the good old-fashioned 90s money teaching and explain my perspective on them today in 2023. So the first 90s money principle that comes to mind is the envelope system. So this is a major throwback. Now all the Gen Zers have brought it back and they call it cash stuffing. So basically it's where you take envelopes in different categories of your budget and you cash out those categories, put them in envelopes and you spend out of the envelope. So you could have an envelope that says restaurants and every time you go out to eat, you take your restaurant envelope. Or if you have groceries, you take it to the grocery store, even gas. Yeah, yeah. Some people go pay for gas with cash inside and they come out. So it's just a way to actually handle your money so you can stay accountable to that line item in your budget. And studies still show that you actually spend less when you spend with cash. Uh, Even though the trend, girl math, has negated that. And they say, if you have cash, it actually almost feels free. Uh, But the idea that you know the money is gone, it does something to your psyche that credit cards don't. When you borrow someone else's money, that emotional attachment just isn't there. So the old envelope system is so great. And I actually came out with my own wallet called the Rachel Cruz Wallet. And it makes it super easy. It has dividers within it. The wallets are super cute. I partnered with Join, uh, an incredible company out of India to help make these. And it's fantastic. So make sure to check out the Rachel Cruz Wallets because it makes the envelope system way cuter than just regular paper envelopes. All right, the second 90s at principle is sinking funds. So if you've never heard the term sinking funds, it's basically a small short-term savings fund within your monthly budget that you're gradually contributing to for an upcoming expense, like a big trip or Christmas or buying a new car or saving up for a kitchen appliance. So anything you have coming up that you're saving for You just save a little bit each month. And then when that expense is there, you have all the money saved. So I love this. I love the idea of a sinking fund because it makes you really plan out what's happening. So if it's, you know, March and you're looking at Christmas, instead of trying to buy all your Christmas stuff and save up money in October, November for it, you're planning way in advance. So that's what I think is so powerful about it is putting some money aside, knowing exactly where that purchase is going. 
Uh, I've talked about it a few times here on the show, but Winston and I, we've been saving for a pool over the last few years. And like we have this certain account that we put money towards and it's like our pool funds. So we know exactly where it's going. Now, a great thing to make this easy is an app called Every Dollar. It's a great budgeting app. And you can actually put the line items in your budget that you're saving for, these sinking funds. So sinking funds are powerful. They were taught in the 90s and they are still being taught today because they still work. All right, the third 90s money principle is investing 15% of your paycheck into retirements. And this is what I mean when the industry or the landscape has changed, but our principles have stayed consistent. So we technically have more options available to us now when it comes to investing, but the goal is still the same. So whether it's a Roth IRA, HSA, or a 529 account, no matter what tool you're using, to invest in, investing 15% of your income specifically into retirement is great. Now, a 529 plan and an ESA are great options when it comes to your kids' college. But regardless of the advice, investing is still so, so key. So, you know, some people think, well, regardless of where you are, you should be investing, but we still teach that you should be debt-free with a fully funded emergency fund before you look at retirement. And again, people, you know, they they say, oh my gosh, you should be investing in more stuff than just mutual funds. You know, you should be investing in crypto and all these things. But first and foremost, we want you to max out retirement. So your 401k and Roth IRA should be the focus. And those things have been the focus for a long time. It's what we've talked about since the 90s and it still works today. So if you want to check out our investment calculator at RamseySolutions.com, do that because it's just a fun way not only to track your progress, but to play with some numbers and see, okay, if I start investing, what does it look like for me in 30 years? Because the 90s were 30 years ago, you guys. Doesn't it feel like if you're like around my age, that the 90s were like 10 years ago? Like, I feel like I'm stuck in the year 2000. (laughs) It's like, yeah, the 90s were just, yeah. No, it was 30 years ago, 30 years ago. And if people were listening in the 90s and they were investing then, how much money they would have now. So this is your time to shine, you guys. Take that 90s money advice today in 2023 and invest 15% of your income into retirement. All right, the fourth 90s principle is paying off debt and living on less than you make. Sounds really simple, you guys. But man, this principle has stayed tried and true to the Ramsey Solutions Megaphone, that's what we talk about all the time. And debt definitely existed 30 years ago, but it's become so much more common in our culture today. There are more and more opportunities to fall into debt every single day. And I don't know about you, but it feels like every time I check out at a store, they're asking for me to sign up for a credit card to get 10% off. You don't need it, you guys. You don't need it. You don't need debt. You don't need it. And it's become so, so common. I saw a Instagram reel where there was a news story about McDonald's taking credit cards in the 90s. And everyone's like, oh, that'll never take off. Well, fast forward to today, it's like what everyone uses. So I'm telling you, the quickest and simplest way to build wealth is to pay off all of your debt, live within your means, have margin to save, to invest, to give. It is so much better than to live paycheck to paycheck with payments. All right, one thing that these 90s principles have in common is that they've all been traced back to the Ramsey baby steps. So the baby steps have been around since the 90s. And again, this is another principle that has stayed tried and true. So the baby steps is basically these seven steps that you need to take when it comes to your money. Everything from starting with baby step one, a thousand dollar emergency fund, all the way up from paying off debt, fully funded emergency fund, investing in retirement, kids college, paying off your house and giving generously. It is all there and it has stayed consistent, you guys, because it works. It works works. And I meet people every single week who have been winning with their money just because they're working the baby steps. You know, I think about even Jade Warshaw, one of our Ramsey personalities, George Camel. I'm like, they were, you know, in crazy different situations when they started this and they are proof that it works. And it's not just them. It's everyday people that we talk to. And so the amazing thing is though, the first step that you take to financial freedom though is getting on a budget. And a budget is something we've talked about since the 90s as well. So my favorite app to use when it comes to budgeting is every dollar. And I talked about it earlier today with the sinking funds, but I'm going to put a link in the show notes for you to download the free version today because the stuff you guys over time, it works. And we want you to win with money. We want you to take control of your money. So do the plan, do the steps in order, and you're going to see progress. Hey guys, it's Rachel. If healthcare costs are increasing while your available choices are decreasing, check out Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM is a biblically-based health cost-sharing ministry, and it's an affordable alternative to health insurance. Find out more at chministries.org slash budget. That's chministries.org slash budget. 
So today, I want to talk to you about four things that you must include in your budget. So no matter how frugal you're trying to be, there are a few categories that should and kind of have to be in your budget. So there are needs in your budget and there are wants in your budget. And needs are necessities that almost everyone has to spend money on every single month. And wants... Well, they're more kind of like fun luxury purchases. So today I want to talk to you about how to determine what qualifies as an essential purchase and how you can confidently cover those needed expenses while you're making progress with your other money goals. So first, let's talk about the difference between needs versus wants, because this is a part of budgeting that everyone must master no matter what income you bring in, because, well, they can get very convoluted in today's world. So What I always call your four walls are your needs, okay? So these are things you have to have, which is food, housing, utilities, and transportation. Everything else is a want in life, and they're not necessary to survive. Like, we are talking survival here. And sometimes, again, these are very obvious. Like, a new designer bag obviously is a want, but sometimes the lines can be a little bit blurry, you know? Like, for instance, food is takeout, food a necessity or is it more of a luxury? So even within those four walls, there can be luxuries. So you want to be aware of them. Now, of course, there are some other examples of wants like concert tickets and subscription boxes and traveling, expensive hobbies, monthly nail appointments, luxury cars, daily stops at your local coffee shop, going to the movies, like all of that, right? So those are all things that you don't have to have. So I think it'd be really helpful to go back to last month, look at your checking account online and go through every line item every line item and just say, okay, what were things that we had to have or we wouldn't survive? And it can be pretty convicting, but it also can be very helpful because you'd be like, okay, for a season, can we just cut this stuff out? And what's crazy is if you cut your wants out long enough, you may not even want them back. So again, go through and actually just just look at it because the key here is you want margin back in your budget because you want to be able to be working on getting out of debt. You want to be working on saving up for an emergency fund. And all of those things are in the Ramsey baby steps. The very first step is to get $1,000 saved. $1,000. So be cutting things out of your life to get some extra cash in to save that $1,000. Then you're going to keep cutting things like that, maybe even getting a side hustle. And you're going to be putting that towards paying off debt. And then an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses, which is baby step three. And once all that is done, you can bring some things back into your life. But looking at your needs versus wants, you guys, and cutting way back in your budget is going to help you so, so much. So there are some wants, you know, that we that we all have in our budget. And so for Winston and I, oh my gosh, it was for sure food. Going out to eat for us was such a luxury. And we were like, okay, so we, we slowed that down for a season. There were things that we went through. And we're like, okay, we're not gonna go do all the extra splurges because we were saving up for a house. We've had some financial goals. And again, it's crazy because at first it kind of hurts. It's like, oh man. But then once you live without it for a while, you're like, okay, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. So it's a powerful thing, but I'm telling you guys, find that margin. Okay, next I wanna break down the four walls that I mentioned earlier and explain to you why you truly do need them in your budget. So first up is food. You guys, it's a necessity, isn't it? Yes. But the lines can be a little blurry because food can be like all over the map, right? Like we can be talking like eating at home, rice and beans, all the way up to like a nice steak dinner, right? So I'm like, they can run the gamut. So listen, I know it can be hard because we all love pizza delivery, Chick-fil-A, like all these things, but restaurants and Uber Eats, they don't count as necessities. They are not needs. So while you're getting out of debt, pull back from going out to eat and, and take out and especially, especially food delivery services, you guys. They, golly, you spend so much money on fees doing that. So again, while you are getting out of debt and you're paying off your debt or you're saving up for your emergency fund, this is a great place to find margin. And it's a great thing too, because you'll be grocery shopping more, but you'll be eating at home and saving money. So listen, this isn't all bad news because what if you saw this as as a fun challenge to be like, okay, what recipes can we do? Can we do breakfast for dinner? My kids love that and it's super cheap. Do taco night, do spaghetti, like like, like get these meals in rotation. And again, it's not gonna be forever, but for, for some months, just say, hey, we're going to really, pare it down. Now, my friend Jade Warshaw paid off almost half a million dollars of debt with her husband, Sam. And she is one of the biggest believers, though, that you don't have to skimp on quality meals just because you're on a budget. So listen, from her, she has done this in a really fantastic way. So I want you to learn some new tricks and try out a new couponing app or whatever you have to do 
to make this fun, to make this enjoyable for a season, and to know that it is going to be some sacrifice. All right, the next category in your four walls is shelter or housing. So this can either be your rent or your mortgage. So when you put together your rent or your mortgage, property taxes, home insurance, and HOA fees, we always say a good rule of thumb is that you don't want to spend more than 25% of your take-home pay on all of that. Now, this is important because you need a place to live. So you want to make sure that you're taking care of that. You're paying your rent, you're paying your mortgage. You don't want to get behind on those things. But you also don't want those things eating up half of your income. So if you're bringing in money, but half of it is going to your rent or your mortgage, you're not gonna have a lot of money left to be able to pay for the other necessities in your life, but also to be able to use your income to do things like paying off debt or saving up for your emergency fund or other things in life. So again, pairing back that, so you may realize, oh my gosh, we have way too much house. Well, I'm living in an area that is way too expensive for my income. It may mean changing a couple of things, but it is worth it. It is worth it. I don't want your home to be a curse. I want it to be a blessing. And if it's 25% of your take-home pay, that does give you some breathing room to do extra things with your income. All right, the next of the four walls is utilities. So this category includes everything that goes along with your housing. So this is water, gas, electricity, trash service, phone plan, internet. I mean, like all the things that cost you money. And since these costs can fluctuate month to month, take the average of the last few months and use that estimate up front in your budget. Then if you come in a little under budget, you can adjust that category. Or if it comes in more, like your water bill was higher, then put it up. And then that means you're going to find a few more dollars from a different category category. But what's key here is that these things are covered. Again, these are necessities. Even before you pay your debt, these things need to be covered. We don't want your lights shut off or your water shut off. So take care of those utilities. It's really important. And remember, streaming services do not qualify as necessities. I know, Reese and Jen, they will be waiting for you on Apple TV when you return, I promise. It is difficult, but Save that money while you can. All right, finally, the fourth category in your four walls is transportation. So this is gonna include gas for your car, public transportation, routine maintenance on your vehicles, like whatever you have going on with your car to make sure that you're able to get to and from work. Again, for some of you, it's public transportation, that you have a way to do that because you have to be able to go to work to be able to make money, to be able to do all the things we're talking about. So yeah, a plane ticket to Disney sadly does not count in transportation. So listen, if you have a car and you have a massive car payment that you can't pay off in 12 months, say 18 months, if it's more than half of your annual income, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Sell it. If you get take a loss, then take a small payment out for that and then a beater car that you're going to buy on the side. I mean, you would rather have an $8,000 loan than a $42,000 car loan. You, when you look at the math, if you want to get out of debt fast, the car is usually the thing that you can sell and get ahead on this stuff. Because you can always go buy a car again. You can always upgrade a car later when you actually have the money. But it's not worth staying in debt, losing sleep at night, feeling stressed, having your income go out to a car payment consistently. So again, if you can't pay it off in 12 to 18 months, or if it's more than half of your annual income, get rid of it. So here's the thing, you guys, when you understand and start implementing your four walls into budgeting, it makes this process even a little bit easier because you create these four walls, you make sure all of your needs are covered, which is so great, and then you get to create a a spending plan underneath that. So cover those needs, then throw everything else you have at your debt, and then start dreaming about your wants again and go through and say, okay, what other things are in there? Because there are some things like childcare, insurances. I mean, there are some big ticket items there that are going to probably feel like needs too, right? That you're going to want to put. But don't go add in all the luxuries or all the things that you're like, yes, we can cut out those wants. Keep them cut out until you're out of debt and have your emergency. So now that you know about the four things that everyone should include in their budget, it's time to actually make one yourself. So go to the Every Dollar app because it is the perfect tool to help you get started. Download it today and plug in those four walls. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, you guys, it's Rachel, and I love fall. The changing colors, the cooler weather, the cute flannels. But let's be real, there can be some downsides too. It gets dark earlier, cooler weather can turn into colds, and fall can remind you of all the things you have to do before the holidays get here. So whatever this time of year means to you, be aware and take care of yourself. Therapy can be a bright spot in the middle of all the potential anxiety, something to make you feel grounded and give you the tools to manage change. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp is flexible because it's totally online, so you can fit it into your schedule, which is busier now with school activities. 
Just fill out a short questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Rachel Cruz today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Rachel Cruz, C-R-U-Z-E. Today, I want to talk to you about money traps. So since my job is to teach people about money when it comes to budgeting and investing and giving and all the things, it's easy to assume that I've got everything together all of the time. But of course, you guys know that is not true. And no matter who you are, you're at risk of getting off track when it comes to your money. And as a Ramsey kid, I was fortunate to grow up to learn wise financial principles from a young age and know how to implement them and live those out. But even though I was taught to avoid some obvious money traps like debt or bankruptcy, there's still some of those sneaky ones that I had to work through as an adult. So today I want to do three things. Number one, tell you about the money trap that inspired Ramsey to begin with. Number two, tell you about one of the traps that I fell for and honestly still have to be aware of. And number three, hear the money traps that you guys are facing and give some hope to them. All right, so first I want to share about why Ramsey exists in the first place and why I get to do what I do. So my dad, you know, back in the 80s, bought a ton of real estate that he borrowed a lot of money on, kind of that zero down real estate where you go and you buy and you flip and you sell for a profit. You take that money, you invest it, and you just kept playing this game, 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 until one day the bank called all of his notes. He had to pay for everything in cash. I didn't have the cash because it was all tied up in real estate, tried selling everything. Long story short, had to file for bankruptcy. And I was a baby at the time. They filed the year I was born. Out of that, he realized, oh my gosh, how does money work? I thought I could use debt to help me build wealth. And yet it came crashing down. And so what this pain that was caused, this, uh, this moment of I'm done. I'm done doing things my way. He started to look up and say, okay, what are common sense ways to live with money? What does the Bible say about money? And he took these things into account and started applying them to our family's life. It started working. And then he started counseling people uh, on what to do with their money. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And you had books and the radio show and all the things. And that's what it came out of. But it came out of a lot of pain. It came out of a lot of mistakes. So That's one thing I want to tell you is that for a lot of people, again, their money journey begins with a lot of pain. It doesn't have to, but for a lot of people, it does. Okay, so next, let's talk about the money trap that eventually led me to make a change. So like I mentioned earlier, I feel so grateful that I grew up in a family, yes, that started in bankruptcy when I was born. But as it came out of it, learning, hey, how does money really work? And one quote that I love says that change comes out of pain. And again, at Ramsey Solutions, we we meet a lot of people in a time of pain. They are overwhelmed with their money. They don't know where to start. They don't feel like they can get ahead. And they have these sick and tired moments where they are tired of living this life, feeling that they work hard, but they have nothing to show for it. So when you're caught up in debt or you're constantly stressed from living paycheck to paycheck, there comes that moment where you're like, I'm done. I'm so tired of being sick and tired. And usually at that point is where change starts to happen because the pain is so painful that you want to try something new. And some of the most joyful seasons of growth come out of pain and struggle. And honestly, that sums up a huge part of my story. I mean, my my family's pain, right? Made it possible for me to avoid some of the mistakes that my parents made. But down the road as an adult, I was able to look at that pain and be like, okay, I don't want to choose that. I'm going to choose a different path, choose a different way. And coming out of that tough season, my parents made the conscious decision that they were going to change our family tree and they were not going to pass the burden of debt onto their kids. And even though I've never gone through bankruptcy, I haven't gone through losing everything. I have learned that finding true financial peace ultimately comes down to being intentional. And the number one thing that I've learned is about intentionality is learning to be content. And you guys, that's my money trap. It's it's comparison. But there's this idea that yes, you can do all the right things with money and you can create the great habits, which I want you to do. But still, if your heart isn't changed, if your heart isn't at a place that can either handle that success or you're still fighting this internal battle of trying to keep up, it makes all of it like exhausting still. So the emotional piece of money is very real. And so that comparison game is real. And I'm telling you that contentment, that comes with peace, knowing that you are exactly where you are 
And it doesn't mean that you're, you can't have goals and you can't still be striving, but that contentment gives you a peace in your heart that nothing else will give you. And the comparison is the opposite. It is running and gunning. And that was me. I mean, I was, I was looking at those vacations and like, oh my gosh, this, this. And I can still get into that rhythm. Understanding and learning, hey, that's their life. Good for them. Regardless whether they're doing it with debt or saved up their own money to do it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that maybe more aspirational. Yeah, maybe I would love to take an awesome trip like that. Maybe one day I will. But when you sit there and it turns into a pouting session, that's when the red flag has to go up. It's like, all right, put the blinders on. In comparison, it will never fulfill you because you will always have someone that has more money than you, that's prettier than you, that has a better job than you. I mean, like, that's life, right? We all have that. And that's the problem is like, we used to only know 30 people. And now because of social media, we know billions of people. You can look at anyone at any point in life. And that comparison game is so real. So contentment, you guys, is a huge, huge part of this. And I wrote a book called Love Your Life, Not Theirs. It talks a lot about this because it's such a big struggle. So while the math side of the equation when it comes to money and the habits and what you do day in and day out can be a struggle, but also your emotions and your heart behind money can as well. So I just want to give you some encouragement though, that if that comparison is huge for you, if that's a huge battle for you, practice gratitude, practice focusing on what you have in the present, focus on giving and serving other people and not just focusing on yourself. Those kind of steps will lead you to contentment. Now, the third thing I want to do is what I'm most excited about. And we have a Facebook group where you guys can connect with other people who are in a similar debt-free journey. And I recently read some of your sick and tired moments. And you guys have heard mine. You've heard my dad's. And I just want to inspire you guys with other people. So I'm going to share a few of these because I think it's so powerful to hear some of the challenges that people are going through, but yet some of the joy and the lights that people are seeing when it comes to growth. So Tammy says, I think the start of my sick and tired moment was last year. I was traveling for work and had to pay for everything up front. And when I made the hotel arrangements, the agent told me that the cost of the hotel would be charged at the end of my stay when I checked out. I was supposed to get my paycheck later that week, so I knew it would be covered easily. Well, the hotel tried to take the full charge of the stay when I checked in and there wasn't a enough to cover it. And I begged and pleaded with the manager, assuring her that I would have the rest of the funds later that week, but she wouldn't hear it. Basically, let me stay for one night that I had to pay for and then kicked me out. I had to leave the next day. I was running on four hours of sleep and facing a 13-hour drive back home from Pennsylvania to Illinois. I was so embarrassed and so desperate, and I've never been kicked out of a hotel before. I was supposed to meet my team at work in person for the first time. We all work remote. And I had to tell them I left due to a family emergency. I was too embarrassed to tell them that I had run out of money. I promised myself I would never get myself into that position again. That is so real, you guys. That is so real. All right, Dina says, my sick and tired moment is when I wrote out all my bills and realized how many credit cards I had to manage to accumulate over the years and then added up the monthly minimum payment, which ended up being over $800 a month just for minimum payments. And I was like, no way. I should not be this broke all the time. I work full time, dog sent, rent out rooms in my house. I had to do something. Robin said, my sick and tired moment is when I was having panic attacks in the line at the grocery store because I was terrified that my card was going to be declined. It was a miserable existence. Never, ever again. Haley Joe said, my sick and tired moment was having to ask my parents for money as an adult. It was my low. I did it once and I will never do it again. Rachel said, my sick and tired moment is when I saw my husband cry at the checkout because our card got declined and we had to put things back. I felt so bad. And he told me it would never happen again in his life. And we are 31. So you guys, those are hard moments. Those are hard. That is life. That's life right there. But for a lot of people, it's that moment of hitting that reality and saying, I have to do something different. And change doesn't always have to come out of pain, right? You can choose, hey, I don't have to experience that pain. I'm going to choose to make other decisions and and change what I've been doing? Absolutely. But pain can be a powerful teacher. So thank you so much to all you guys who are so honest and vulnerable and letting us to have a peek into what is going on in your life and what happened for your sick and tired moments. And I truly believe acknowledging the problem in the first place is just a small step to powerful change in your life. And no matter what your financial background is, when you have that sick and tired moment, realize I'm done with this. Whether it's you know something that influences you mentally like comparison, or maybe it's that thing that you're like, I don't have money at the checkout line, at the grocery store, whatever it is, whether it's extreme like bankruptcy or not, it's like whatever it is, let your story be something of power of change for your life. Let it be 
a moment that you say, hey, I can do something different because I believe that you guys, we hear it every single day and I believe that for you. And it is possible, it is possible. So thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Share this with a friend who may need some encouragement. Again, leave a review if you love the podcast. And remember to go to rachelcruz.com and check out I'm Glad for What I Have, my new kid's book. So thanks again, you guys, for listening. And remember to take control of your money and create a life you love.